Hey, what's up, guys? want to welcome you to episode 38 of Street Theology. It's your boy, Adrian. I am here, and we are excited today. Episode 38. Now, I am joined uh, by, again, Cincinnati's finest. I am joined by a man, father of two, spiritual development architect. I mean, a man who's got great wisdom. I mean, I'm going to big him up right now. You know what I'm saying? Because I tell you right now, he's under the weight of the Nehemiah Institute. So when he's leading that, let me tell you, the devil is beating him down, <laughs> so I'm going to big him up right now and let that man feel the encouragement he needs right now. So, Pastor yeah, Derek Hayes, what's happening, man? Nothing much, man. Another day <laughs> in paradise yeah. under the weight. <laughs> Not getting off the, I'm not getting off the ride yet. Don't worry about it. We good. There we go. There we go. That's me and Pastor Derek. That's our thing is we go on this journey together. And again, that's that is fitting for today's podcast. This idea it'll cost you everything, episode thirty eight, because we look at each other and I'm like, yo, you ready to get off this ride? We're like, No, we still on it together. You know what I'm saying? And we just keep moving. And we are also joined by somebody near and dear to me, someone who serves really as the staff architect of the New Rules Collective, which is the consulting company uh, that I started about a year ago. And uh, again, someone who is, I truly believe, is a next generation leader, uh, Brianna Clark. I mean, Bree is, again, 21 years old. She's helping with lead, and she does at such a phenomenal level, a member of Engage. And she, uh, uh, yeah, she is really, a truly an innovative reconciler. Bree, welcome to the podcast today. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, it's going to be fun. And so we're excited about today well guys the whole point again if you are new here on the pod you're listening to us um the whole point of this podcast is simply this is this idea of innovate it really to help prepare and launch innovative reconcilers this idea of taking theology from a high level bringing it down to a street level to your everyday life we believe that the movement that is coming forth is out launching innovative reconcilers into the world who actually establish kingdom expression and so that's what we want to do here is that no matter where you find if you're part of the engaged church family engaged church movement um, or wherever you find yourself uh, we believe that we want to help equip people uh, with street level theology so they can actually go in the world and be able to connect to God and connect others to God, to God, connect people to, to one another, that idea of a minister of reconciliation and also being connected to their meaningful work in the earth. And actually the being connected to their meaningful work inspires others to be connected. Yeah. So that's what we exist uh, here at engage to do, but we actually believe is incredibly important because really it's the minister is idea of sending the priest of the believer out those original call uh, that, that Jesus follows supposed to have. So that's what we do here. And so uh, guys, we are uh, excited today. We have an illustrious guest with mm. us today. Mm. Illustrious. Matter of fact, so much. So we got seven Sound effects, you know. Yeah, I want to make sure everybody know we got sound effects. So if you hear this, don't freak out because you may hear something like this. Hey, Jamaican siren, Rick Ross. Here we go. There we go. We got some other ones, but you're here. But man, our illustrious guest, he needed sound effects to bring him in today. Pastor Brent Gerard, lead pastor in focus church again pastor brent is a dear friend of mine um in focus church i mean really we are part of a collection of churches called every nation and even within the family you have family within the family and in focus church is family within the family you know in every nation we have some people who may be second cousins third cousins mm. again but we also in focus church man they yeah. are first this cousins this, this yeah. barbecue yeah this you know barbecue I mean? this, yeah, this yeah, space yeah. table yeah you this know? is the, it's the people like in focus church is the ones that you know what we go over you know this is the cousin's house you can spend the night at at your mama the house yeah yeah, yeah. Your mom Come on in the air yeah. yeah, your mom would spend a night at your house, and also <laughs> is that when you go over there, listen that 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 uh that uh that relative would actually you know they had the permission to spank you too. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Around, yeah, so, yeah. You know what I'm saying that cousin, you know, is like so close that like you pretend that that's your brother. Yes, like, yeah, really yes, yes. That, is, that is that is that is what info that is what info wow. church is uh, to engage. Pastor Brent, man, that's got welcome me in, to the podcast. In my feels right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, oh, I feel man. the love right here, man. We are excited to be able to film this. And so we're going to jump right in. I mean, the title of really this thing today here is costs you everything. And you're going to get to hear a lot of, um, of just pastor Brent and what's happened at in focus church and the story yeah. of in focus church and, and just some amazing thing that God's doing. But actually, um, again, what we like to talk about is the raw and uncut of what things look like. You know what I mean? Because again, one of the things is that everyone, I always tell people, everybody wants to change the world, but very few people, yeah. you know, you want to change the world, very few people want to go through what it takes to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really painful. And um, and you're going to hear a lot of that today, but you're also going to hear a lot of incredible stuff of what's happening in the midst of that. And so mm -hmm. Pastor Brent, man, welcome to the pod. Yes, my pleasure. I, I am so excited to be able to be a part of this. 
um, and always, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to share whatever God's doing. And it's like, you know, you think about all the opportunities we have to, to maybe speak about something God's doing in our lives. Um, and this will have its own special, uh, I don't know, personality, if you will, because of the things that are going on this week. And um, and so I'm excited about that, what God wants to speak to those of you who are out there on this podcast listening. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be great. So let's get to it. Yeah. All right, Pastor Brent, um, to start us off, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into ministry? Yeah, so I've, uh, I've been in ministry now uh, since probably about I was 16 years old. Um, you know, before that I was, uh, raised in a, a Christian home. I, I, uh, grew up singing. Uh, my mom likes to tell the story that I was singing before I was talking. <laughs> um, and she was a, uh, piano player and a singer. My sister sang. So the three of us would do a lot of singing together, like the Gerard family trio. And, uh, <laughs> we'd go around and sing and yeah, you know, it was, it was, uh. So y'all was a white, y'all was a white sanctified version of Bill Bill DeVoe, huh? <laughs> You want to say the wine? Is it yeah, I, know. Like, I, I say, you see, I said, you see, I said sanctify, right? Wow. I don't, I, I don't know who Bell, Biv, or DeVoe would be in this scenario. No, let's let's go ahead. I know who Bell, Biv, DeVoe is because I was listening to that stuff hardcore when I was in college. Uh, but yeah, I don't. My mom's not going to be Michael Bivens or yeah. So, like, <laughs> So yeah, uh, sometimes our analogies and comparisons just don't work. <laughs> yeah, that one true. might be it. But that's, yes, that's we were true. sanctified. There uh, we go. Maybe, you know, whinings, that would be a good one. <laughs> mm. um, but we would sing wherever anybody would have us. And uh, and so I grew up doing that. I really grew up wanting to be a worship leader, honestly. And this was before the dawn of a lot of worship schools and all of that. Uh, I just wanted to uh, lead worship. I would see people... Uh, you know, in my church doing that, I thought, I want to do that one day. Went to school. I was a vocal performance major. Uh, I actually got my master's degree down here in Tallahassee at Florida State University. Nice. So I was here in the glory years of the football with Charlie Ward, winning the national mm. championship, mm. And, and the glory years of the basketball. I don't know how much everybody was on payroll back then, but it was a good <laughs> Yo, team. easy. Don't say <laughs> this. I, we, I, we, we, we passed the statute of limitations. <laughs> so, you're good. No, yeah, no, yeah. Go ahead. Ooh, it was a good team, though, man. It was. I could start naming some of them players. Mm-hmm. They all went to the NBA. So, uh, yeah. And then um, I went off. After I got back from school, I went home and uh, went back to the church that I was a part of uh, when I was there. And they hired me as a music assistant. I'm like, so uh, I was like assistant to the worship pastor. Uh, that was in 1996. In 97, I became the worship pastor. Um, and then in 2005, uh, the senior pastor at the time transitioned the church over to me, and I became the lead pastor in 2005 and have been in that role ever since. And so uh, my wife and I, Carla, got married in 1997. So she married in, I'm like, you know, we were married and straight into ministry and have been doing that together since day one of our marriage. And uh, so that's another unique side of, of just kind of our testimony and really our life is that we've never not been in ministry together as a couple. I want to do this because again, I, I mean, while we're right there in that vein, because you guys do have a very unique um, kind of calling, you know, um, as a family, is this simple fact that as a family, you know, you guys are really in there right now. You know, your son Caleb yeah. um, leads worship for you. Uh, your son Josiah just joined staff with you guys yeah. um, as well. And again, I know we'll talk a little bit and more my about daughter in law now. Oh yeah, exactly. your daughter. Yeah, your daughter in law is there as well. And then again, you know, and 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 so like, how has that been? I mean, you know, <laughs> I know that like, you know, from the beginning, it's been, you know, it's been something they always have been around. Yeah. But how has that been? And how did you guys intentionally do that? And what was kind of the the thought pattern behind that? I mean, you know, I grew up with me going to church with mom, particularly and singing and worship. It was like that was just a non negotiable. That's what we were doing. And, um, you know, even if my parents couldn't go to church for some reason, they made sure me and my sister went to church with my grandmother. It was like, we never got to not go to church. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, Carla and I, that's all we knew. You know, she grew up a church girl. 
Um, I grew up, like I said, wanting to be a worship leader. And so we were straight into it, started leading whatever, you know, singles ministry. And, and we were both leading worship. She's a singer. So we were on the worship team together too, yeah. which has got us interesting dynamics. And, <laughs> and uh, you're still husband and wife, but you're on the team and we're leading worship. And But then we're also then, you know, a few years later, Caleb comes into the world in 2000 and, and now we're parents. Um, and it was like, you know what? The church is is not on the outer hub of our life. It's the central part of our life. Yeah. And so everything else begins to revolve around my relationship with Jesus Christ and his body, not an add on like, you know, Little League baseball or travel this or hobbies or whatever. It's like, no, this is our family's going to do this together. Wow. And so I remember sh- taking Caleb uh I mean, before he could even walk and we would just sit him down, prop him up on the chair while we were rehearsing because we that's what we had to do. And he would just sit there and watch. Wow. Like we thought, this is weird. Like do all kids do this. <laughs> uh, and then we had Josiah 16 months later. and We realized that all kids didn't do this because <laughs> he never sat still. So and that's why he's a drummer. But, you know, it's one of those things that early on and I have journals to prove it, that I would write write down these prayers while they were, you know, in the crib, uh, and I would pray for them in their room. If they were crying, I'd sit there in the dark saying, please go to sleep, dear God. <laughs> you know, please let them go to sleep. But then I would write down things like, Lord, I want them, one day I want them to be a worshiper of you. I want them to, you know, if, if music's in their life, I want them to love that. I want them to lead worship. I'd love to have the opportunity to lead worship with them one day. Um, and these were things I was like, you know, 21 years ago, I was writing down. Mm. Wow. And then when they started going into music and started doing that at, at church with, you know, the kids, leading kids worship, I was like, man, wow. And then it wasn't a few, it seemed like, you know, a few years down the road. And there I am leading worship on stage and Josiah's behind me playing the drums and Caleb's wow. over there singing on the microphone and my wife's mm. over there singing. And, <laughs> and I thought, these are the things I prayed for. Mm. And it was, man, it was just so... Uh, surreal, uh, but yet at the same time, such a blessing to me. Um, so yeah, I, it's something we've been intentional about. Um, and we also, you know, it wasn't like a forced thing. It was that our kids were going to love the church, no matter what difficulties they saw, saw mom and dad go through. I was going to try to protect them as long as I could from all of that so that they would love people and love the church because that's what we're supposed to do as, as the body. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, let's let's turn the corner real quick because that, those those you know, pastor agent talks a lot about dreams and nightmares, and so when we talked about the uh, the cost you everything, we're talking about you know mm-hmm. God's calling on your life, and so can you can you uh, get into a little bit of like what what is that cost as you are following Jesus? Mm-hmm. How has that impacted the church? Because I know there's some there's a story there that I'm like waiting for the book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, you always think about that. It's like, how do these people write these books and talk about other people Mm -hmm. that, you know, like we don't know who they are, but the people that they're talking about probably know who they are as Mm -hmm. even though they might not mention a name or the names have been changed Mm -hmm. to protect the whatever. Um, so, but yeah, for us, um, you know, going into ministry early on, I, you, you just had this thought. It's like, well, this is going to be great. Where these are Christians. We're going to love each other. We're going to reach the world that, you know, yeah. love God, love people, reach the world is our mission statement. We're going to do that. Um, you know, and it's like the first year, uh, within a year, it was like half the staff, staff had left and, and I had this, you know, kind of relational dysfunction going on and, and in the middle of the staff and I kind of looked around and it was, you know, Nobody was there anymore. Um, the church went from like at that time, probably around 400 people to 160 people. Uh, the money left, you know, and, and I was saddled with a building and a mortgage and, a you know, I was whatever, 20. Well, at that time I was 35, I think. And it was like, what in the world? Um, so that was kind of where I first started realizing, oh, there's a there's a price. Like mm-hmm. relationally, mm-hmm. there's a price. Yeah. Um, and then as we began to change, and that was because we changed a little bit of the vision of the church and we really had, our, our heart was, we wanted to reach people with the gospel. We wanted to reach lost people. We didn't want to just be a holy huddle. And mm-hmm. it's like, we wanted to see the gospel at work and, and I wanted to baptize lost people. And, yeah. you know, I wanted to see the power of the gospel 
operating in people's lives. And so uh, that was the first one. And probably now where we are here in 2019, 2020, 2021 now, there's been a lot of things that we have paid the price for being a multi-generational and multi-ethnic, particularly uh, church. And honestly, if you were to point at two things like on a board and tell people, look, this church is going to be multi-generational and multi-ethnic to a person in most places, everybody would be like, that's awesome. Yeah. That'll be cool. Yeah. Yeah. We're for that Mm -hmm. until it actually starts to happen. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, they're too young. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't believe, you know, his son's already leading this or, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. Oh, now there's uh, people of color that are on the stage and uh, now they're on the screen and oh, now they're leading worship and now they're on staff. And and nobody would say that typically out loud, but we're all okay with the idea of being diverse in passing, smiling at each other in, in the foyer or whatever. But when people are empowered, both the young and the, the minority, if you will, or the people of color or, the, or women or young people, when they're empowered and they take positions that you, in your mind, had reserved for somebody else that looks more like you, yeah. it changes. Mm-hmm. And I had, I had no idea what the cost would be. Wow. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. I, 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 you know, you think you do. Yeah. yeah. And, and I want to, let's go, let's keep going into that because, yeah. um, you know, one of the things I can give you guys context, you know, cause again, one of the things I love about Brent is that he's going to, um, there is a humility that is uh, such that marks his life. One of the things is that he talks about how the church shrunk to 160, but also the church grew to almost 1500 people and things are going great and things are moving well. And, and man, and, and there was no people of color and there was one guy, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When we yeah. first started and he's still alive. Actually. I just yeah. visited him <laughs> oh, a couple wow. of weeks ago, 90 years old, Wow, 90 years old. And I tell you what, I'll tell you guys, cause I'm going to put it out there. So it forces us to do it. We're going to actually start recording going down there meeting with him. Cause he can have visitors now post COVID. Mm. We're going to meet with him, video him and record him wow. telling his stories wow. uh, yeah, because wow. he grew up, Scraven County, uh, Jenkins County, wow. 1930s, Sheesh. right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm like, I ain't missing out on these stories because <laughs> yes. that was the first black man that was at our church and he was there every Sunday, beat me there. Uh, but yeah, we were, there was that time, like you said, you know, we were maybe one couple, you say, Hey, we're a multi-ethnic church and people look around and go, I don't think that means what he thinks that means. <laughs> it's just like, does he know the definition of multi-ethnic? Yeah. And, uh, and so, but if without having intentionality, without That's saying right, it, it yeah. never happens. Right. And so we were intentional about it, even in the people that would teach and then my friends that would come up and speak like pastor Adrian and others. And so, yeah, it, but it, it grew pre COVID, you know, and, and then we were starting to see some of that, yeah. but not like now. Yeah. And then, and so then the transition, and this is what I want to dive into. We start talking about costing everything because at that point in time, man, it's riding the wave. You know mm-hmm. I mean? Well, I mean, the thing that you set out to do, man, you said we wanted to, we changed the church. We wanted to see lost people get baptized. You're yep. baptizing people. Yep. Uh, man, you went from one to, man, I mean, you know, again, I saw it every year I was coming. I saw more and more. Uh, people of color who were part of the, uh, and then again, it seemed like, man, people liked it. They got along and everything like that. Then 2020 happened. And then all of a sudden, you know, um, you begin to, and you begin to talk about justice and talk about, hey, man, uh, the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, I mean, Breonna Taylor. And you begin to speak to that. You begin to talk about that. Um, and then all of a sudden, you begin to also empower people. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it seems like now it went from, yeah, 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 we like this idea to now we got a problem with this. Mm -hmm. And over the last year and some change, it has cost you a ton, you know, and I want you to kind of speak that because, again, it's I mean, I tell people everybody talks about reconciliation and diversity in the world we want to live until 
you know, you are in a place to where now it's going to cost you something. I mean, because you think about you are in Augusta, Georgia. I mean, there's a lot of them again, and we can get to this later. A lot of strong. There's a lot of demonic things that are there. I mean, it is a place where racism was incredibly, incredibly high Um, racism within the context even of the church. Things were done there. And so there's something bigger that you're fighting. But once you start doing this, it was literally like all hell has broken loose when you did that. So. Kind of talk a little bit about that story of what kind of began to happen there. Yeah, and you're right. Um, the city itself is, is you know, we're in Evans, which is a suburb of Augusta. And, you know, even the Southern Baptist Convention started in Augusta. Wow. Uh, and split off from the Baptist Convention because of slavery. Yeah. Uh, for the rights to be able to, to own slaves and whether they could be, mis- you know, evangelized, all that. Even the Presbyterian Church there, same situation. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's dad was a uh, the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Augusta. Wow! Uh, Woodrow Wilson was the guy that you know. If there was, he was a, he was definitely a racist himself. <laughs> uh, had had a showing of a movie that we won't even talk about up yeah. at the White House. But wow. um, um, so yeah, uh, 2020 was. I, I'm looking over there at Liquid Death, and it's like it's <laughs> like drinking Liquid Death. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it's water, people. That's what it is. Just in case. Yeah. Uh, you guys see this online, yeah. here we go. Again, it's, it's not water. a Coors Light. Right? <laughs> even it's though not it's a Colt that, 45. Hey, yeah, I was say, even though it's in that tall boy, though. <laughs> so we're back to, now we're back to the cookout, right? Yeah. Where's that yes. Magnum? Uh, so, yeah, we uh, 2020, COVID hit. And you're right. It was like we were riding the wave, you know, with three services, building project. Uh, we're expanding. We're in this multi-million dollar, you know, faith type building project. We've, we're going from a, you know, a 400 seat auditorium to an 800 plus seat auditorium, um, expanding. I won't even say how big the project ended up being because it's never, you know, what they say it is when you first start. 100%. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and really, I'll say this again, too, as it relates to the cost. I remember the day that everything changed. It was mm-hmm. it was Mother's Day of, of 20, I guess that was 2020. Yeah. Um, and uh, we hit COVID hit, which, I mean, who could prepare for that? It's like all of a sudden mm-hmm. you're not even in the building mm-hmm. that you're supposed to be using, you know, for nobody's in there. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, God, really? This is <laughs> This is where we're we're going with this. So then you're like, okay, well, it can't get any worse than this. We'll get back sooner or later, you know, a couple of weeks. And then, you know, it kept carrying on. Well, then Mother's Day rolls around. We're straight streaming. Nothing's happening in the building. We're doing everything online like probably all of you all are. Um, And at the end of the Mother's Day message, which my wife taught, I just said, you know what? I got to say something about this Ahmaud Arbery thing. I can't let this go. We're If we're a multi-ethnic church, I've got to speak to the fact that it's hitting our church differently yeah. Yeah. than, you know, it would maybe a monochromatic church. And so I, I just said something and I, and I said, look, this, there's a mother that's grieving today. And, and as a church like ours, we should grieve with those who grieve. Yeah. Um, and this was a racist act. And that next week, I started having at least I had two meetings where people were just, I can't believe you used the word racist. And I'm sitting there thinking, I can't believe that I would use the word. What do you mean? <laughs> like, I, I look, I got relatives in Brunswick. I mean, I, I saw the video. It wasn't like this grand leap of faith that I was projecting <laughs> yeah, out there. And yeah. if it wasn't, and that's what comes like, well, you don't know the whole story. I'm like, I know enough of the story. Yeah. yeah. I saw enough of the story. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I'm I, no apologies. That's what I, I said, what I said. And if something changes, I'll come back and offer a public apology. And I was like, I, I literally was like, okay, this has got to be it. Like this guy should be the height of the stupid conversations <laughs> mm-hmm. that I'm going to have. Mm. And it was just the beginning. Wow. Yeah. And that's what I said. I would have never, if somebody says, you know, did you count the cost? I'm like, I thought I did, but we never do, right? Mm-hmm. We, you you yeah. say, like Jesus, count the cost before you build. You know, that's what a wise builder does. And we do. Mm-hmm. But just like a new, you know, a, a couple moving into a new house for the first time, and they say, well, this is what your estimated mortgage is yeah, going to yeah, be, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, we count the cost. We can afford this. And then you get the first bill, and you're like, what the heck is PMI? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Insurance. Yeah, and then I got insurance mm-hmm. on top of my insurance <laughs> and, and taxes, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden that bottom line is like way more than you ever thought it was. <laughs> yes, and you counted the cost, yeah. 
it just it is without you know the foreknowledge that that God only God has you really don't know. It's just, are you willing when you get there to say, wow. okay, I'll pay that too. There it is. You yeah. know, there it is. Okay. I didn't see that cost. That was a hidden cost, but I want this so bad. I'll pay that too. And we do that with our house. It's mm. like, well, we moved in here. I want this house so bad. I'll give this up mm. to make sure I can afford mm. to pay this. Mm. And, uh, and there were things that we had to give up to make sure that we could pay this. And a lot of it was relationships. Wow. And I'm talking relationships that I've had for 10, 15, 20 years mm-hmm. and just gone, gone. And, and I'm not saying, listen, if, because if anybody listens and there may be people listening that have gone that listen to this from our church, Adrian wants all the comments on the YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. He wants all hey, the smoke. Yeah, all of them. Like, bring please, it. yeah, please bring them all. Please bring them all yeah. to me. Cause if you actually think Brent's hard. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, we know, we know that we are very different in that area. We, <laughs> we help each other out. You like, he's like, here's the end of the book. Let's close it now. And I'm like, well, let's read a few chapters. Yeah, that's, that's that's right. we do. We do. That is one thing. I get that's the great part about being a family. Because, you, like I said, me is choose your own adventure. Oh, yes. Yeah, end of the book. I know how to get there. Let's get to the end. But sometimes, you know what? <laughs> reading a couple of chapters, actually, you can change the story. And so Pastor mm-hmm. Brent actually helps me oh, with that. I like that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But, but what I can actually do with him sometimes, I'm like, Hey, bro, we've been reading like eight chapters, man. Like the, the book is, we know yeah, where this book's going. Right. I tell him, close the book. Yeah. Let's get to the end so we can move on. Yeah, he tries to help me close the book sometimes. <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, so for us, it, it was it was something that we knew we wanted to do. And, and listen, here's the interesting thing. This isn't something new. It's like it's not something new that I've been saying. I've been saying this since 2005. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I've been preaching messages since 2005 when things would happen in our, in our nation or, in, you know, in our region or whatever, we would talk about this. We talk about Ephesians and we talk about the body of Christ. We talk about how this is a, a acts and what this testimony is to the world around us of the power of the Holy spirit to draw, you know, people that were once enemies and, and make them family. Like that's, Wow, people see that and they go, yeah. those people have been with Jesus and yeah. we need that. Yeah, yeah. We've been I've been preaching this, we've been preaching this for years. But something changed in 2020. Yeah. And uh and I think a lot of it changed with the way our staff began to change, who began to be a part of our staff. Uh the church began to change. You can even see it today. You can see it. It's just mm. and for as if for many people that feel uncomfortable and like Oh, I don't want to be a part of that for whatever reason they may give. And there's a lot of smoke screens that we don't have to, you know, we've all heard the smoke screens where y'all are teaching CRT or y'all are Marxist or y'all are this. And I'm like, Mm. half the stuff that I've been accused of, I had to go look up (laughs) like to go, uh, what do you think about CRT? I say, I I don't, I don't think about that, but let me go look it up. Um, but for as many people that don't like it or whatever the case may be, or, or feel, uh, uh, pressed or, or like the gospel is actually poking at some things that need to change. There's a lot that are coming in that go, this is why they're coming. Mm-hmm. We, we, we feel welcomed for the first time. We've always felt out of place at a church. Uh, we didn't know which church we, we should belong to. And, and mm-hmm. God has given us a place to feel like we belong. Mm. And isn't that what the body of Christ is supposed to be? A yeah. place where anybody feels like they can belong. That's it. That's it. Mm-hmm. And, and let me just say this, and I know, Bree, you have a question, but I think, like, yeah. here's my my thing for people is that a lot of times, yeah, the accusation of stuff, and you're like, I agree with you, but I'm like, most people don't even know. 90% of people, 95%, 90, listen, not, I would venture to say 95% of people in our country don't really know and cannot explain what CRT is right. or critical yeah. race theory. They can't do it. What that is, though, many times is this. Yes, there are things that you need to be aware of. There are things that are rooted in it that's not, you know, that's not okay and all that. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is this. It ends up being a smoke screen. And here's what no one's talking about. No one's talking about how, and again, I'm going to keep saying this and keep trumping this, is that how when you don't have an answer right now for justice, if you are just kind of saying, well, you know, we all just get together and all just get along and all the stuff, and you have no real answer, no real gospel thing, that what's happening is that people of color, very specifically black men and women are leaving the churches in droves Mm -hmm. they're leaving it in droves and i'm not talking about going to other churches they're not going to church Mm -hmm. so they're becoming some of the most underreached people in our country today Mm -hmm. so let me tell you this i'm fine people don't talk about crt this is what i want to hear from people then then tell me how you're going to reach black people and people of color tell me how you're going to do it because like so here's the thing 
Because if you don't, because that's what, and no one can ever give me that. Okay. We stopped talking about that. Then now you tell me what, oh, we just yeah. need to keep preaching the gospel. Okay. That's what you've been doing. And there's still no people of color who are showing up to your churches. That's there's right. no yeah. people coming. Right. So then what you're saying doesn't work either. Right. So now right. give me something else. And see, yeah. that's the issue that's at hand because all this becomes is smoke screens mm-hmm. for people not wanting to do the work of the gospel. That's yeah. the issue. Right. You don't want to do the work of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, too, I just want to end and say this point is that also, man, like we worry. And again, I, I've been saying this from stage a lot lately. When you are in peacetime, you can just keep arguing and talking about the stuff like this over and over again. When you're in wartime, you know what? You're like, yo, I don't got time to deal with this. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. I literally have no place to talk to you about CRT, talk to you about, you know, hey, I think, you know, play both sides. What about, I just don't have any time. Why? Because there are lost people going to hell. There's a world, there are people right now who in desperate need of seeing the gospel. There are places where we need to bring the kingdom and lift it up. And so that's what I'm going to be about. I'm about solving problems. And that's it. If you're about solving problems, let's get to work. If you are not, then don't waste my time. It's a waste of time right now. And I just think that that's where ultimately, you know, Brent, where you got into is a place of what you guys started building. And so it's just it's just a unique season we're in. But I think something switched so much in 2020, but it's about that type of work. There's a wait. There's a waste of time that I have tried to balance because I, you know, in, in the kind of codependent side of me that I have tried to, to deal with and work through with Jesus. Um, I want to make things right and and I'm going to kind of clamp down and hold on and, and, and think that I can somehow appeal to you enough, uh, that you'll see my side and that we'll be able to get along. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've, I've spent a lot of time, I've been in a lot of conversations and some people, multiple conversations and, and to a person, I was telling somebody recently on the staff, I'm like, you know, I've been in, I can't even count how many conversations I've been in over the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. And you know how many, how many people's minds I've changed? Like one, Mm -hmm. one. And, and, and that's wow. like, so it's like my, my kind of life verse is from yeah. Nehemiah six, right? It's like, I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. And so yeah. I've got to figure yep. out when it. I'm not going to come down. It's not because I don't love you. It's not because yeah. you're not uh, made in the image of God. It's not because I don't care, but you don't care what I have to say. Yeah. Your reason for me speaking with you has, you don't want to change your mind. You don't mm-hmm. want to hear what I have to say. You've heard what I have to say. You don't like it. Yeah. And so I'm wasting my emotion, my energy, my time. And I'm not doing what God's called me to do in building the way God's called me to build. And here's what the enemy does. And as you were saying that, like with the CRT stuff and, and all these books that get written, it's just like, come on, man. If, if you call Tim Keller and Matt Chandler, like Dude. liberal, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm hey, out. Hey, like I'm going yeah. to get a sound right, effect, right? Yeah. Yes. 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 He's a yeah, Jamaican yeah, yeah. air horn. Yeah. Hey, if that's what yeah, you man. start saying, I, I, you're, I'm out. You know, I'm not what, but here's what the enemy does. The enemy always has counterfeits to the truth that, that yeah, God yeah. gives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's That's always great. a counterfeit. So here's the problem that I see with what we're trying to do as a multi-ethnic church, or as a, let's call it the, the church of acts, like where everybody, the mm-hmm. dividing walls are broken down and we're worshiping together. It's parallel roads. So yeah, CRT's over here and the gospel's over here and they're, they're parallel roads. Like mm-hmm. they're trying to get to the same place. Mm-hmm. Mm. But only one gets there. Mm. And that's what we're saying, by the way. No, right. Nobody's saying that it, CRT gets us there. Yeah. Right? Mm. So it hits a dead end at some point, like every other human government or human idea, because it doesn't have Jesus and the gospel in it. But it's parallel. And so people can look at us, and it looks very similar in one place. And so they just say, y'all are just like this, like, no, we're not. Yeah, there's, well, they are actually doing that. And if the church had done that, we'd be leading. And instead we're having to catch up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we, we, we Ooh. don't. Yeah. Ooh. But we're playing yeah. from behind. Like we're trying to come back in the last quarter and win this thing mm-hmm. because we do have the answer. Our parallel road keeps going. This one and every other human institution hits a dead end. Yes, sir. But yeah. the church and the body of Christ and the gospel goes all the way to where enemies become friends and family. That's great. That's great, man. That's great. No, that is that is incredible. You need to go back, hit the back button yeah. on your Moment podcast. Of silence for everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Podcast. Just take a deep breath. Yeah, go back hit, rewind. Go back hit that back button because I was I mean it's, it's I mean you just spoke on it. And so I mean it's it's so true. Why are we 
it's every human thing starts with simply this. The human beings are good and structures and systems are bad. And so there's just us trying to figure it out. And we ultimately say, as people who are followers of Jesus, that humans are bad and mm-hmm. humans create bad systems. Right. But to say that CRT isn't a tool, but because here's the thing. But because I believe this, we aren't spirit-filled individuals. We're anxiety-filled individuals. We cannot take something that's a tool and say, oh. Oh, yeah, but we can, though. What about an Enneagram? Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, Churches use that all the time, right? Oh, but but you know what? (laughs) Yes, and I agree Strength finders. Mm. We use tools, yes, yes. But, oh, you can't do that, though, because. Because let's just say it. Let's just say it. When it comes to talking about black people, Mm -mm, we got a problem. Like, that's what, like, this, I can say this, and I'm going to say it. I am so tired. Why is it an issue when every time it becomes about black people, Mm -hmm. then it's like, well, hold on now. It's because you know what's happened in 2020? Black people have finally simply said this, is that we do not, you don't have to, you're not going to define to us anymore who we are. And we know there's real issues and you're not going to convince me they're not issues. Yeah. And yes, can we take things and can people take things too far? Absolutely. Sure, right. Like mm-hmm. everybody else does. But it does not mean that God's not highlighting this in this current cultural moment that we're living in. And that's the disruption. And let me tell you this for everyone listening. And I'll keep saying it. If the church did its job, then there would not be Black Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. But because we don't do our job, then other things have to arise. And then we want to point it because we have have a freaking losers mentality yeah. Yeah. losers right, are always pointing about whatever but jesus rose from the dead so if he rose from the dead and that power lives inside of us then are you are you really telling me crt and black lives matter man that that's going to destroy everything or actually <laughs> the fact that jesus reigns the dudes who preach the gospel go read your bible and realize this nothing will overtake his kingdom but actually right. what he's looking yeah. for is men and women to take the gospel yep. into places that are going to make you uncomfortable that's the issue you're going to have to be uncomfortable now and mm-hmm. here's the thing i love my white brothers and sisters but you know what that may mean that may mean sometimes that the most outspoken the voices that are heard right now are people who don't look like you and that's yeah. the first time you ever have to experience that yeah mm-hmm. and that's the world that's we're good. going to and all of a sudden, everybody wants to have an issue. That does not mean that those who are white are excluded or they won't have a place to play. Oh, of course But not. let right. me tell you this. But you know what? You know what it's like? This is one thing I know. Being a black man, I know the feeling of not being brought in. I'm never going to do that to somebody. Mm. I know what it's like to not have a voice. I know what it's like to walk in and be like, man, their perception about me. I don't like when people feel that. So if you are white and you are whatever political affiliation, and you're in a room, man, I'm going to make you, I'm going to bring you in because I know what that's like. Mm-hmm. And see, that is where it's powerful. And that is where I think it's happening. So and that's what I'm, Jesus does, right? He, he brings the marginalized. He brings the people in that nobody else would bring in. He brings the people in that everybody else put out. He brings the people in that don't feel like they have a place. And that could be the adulterous woman. That could be the, you know, the, the, the leper. That mm-hmm. could be the tax collector. It, it, every, basically, he's just hitting every, the Roman centurion. And he's like, you know, then he's mm. taking everybody off. He's like, nobody's got faith like this Roman centurion. What? You know, it's like, what are you saying? Or the Samaritan, the good Samaritan. What? Mm. It's yeah. like every time Jesus is like, look, if you think we're going to get mono ethnic here and it's all going to be about one group of people, I'm about to, we're, we're going to have Samaritans. We're going to have Romans. We're going to have Scythians. We're going to have barbarians. We're going to have free men, slaves. He's like all of it. We're going to put them all in the kingdom of God because we all come to the foot of the cross on level ground. Yeah. And yeah. that's why all these other things and every other government, I don't, like, listen, Marxism, socialism, capitalism, every ism will mm. never work. Yeah. They all have their ills. One might be better than the other, but it's a human answer. Yeah. And there's only one answer, and that's Jesus, a spiritual answer to the spiritual problem of our human hearts. Yeah. And God's got it. And we know that. So, you know, miss me on the, all the other smoke screens. Dude, that's all I got to miss say. Miss me. All right, Bree, Bree, my bad. I know I want to rant. Sorry, no, but I think no. it's off. I think it's off. What you got, Bree? Um, I really just wanted to hear. Um, what it was like leading your family and also your staff during a time like this where you're not just experiencing relational tears in your church. It's something that's happening on a national and global level, really, because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, leading my 
leading my family and the, the staff is a little bit different, although most, a lot of my family is on staff. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and let me just, let, before I get into what it was like leading them through this, let me say this because I, I think I chased a rabbit at some point, but the other side, we're not just a multi-ethnic church, but we're a multi-generational church. And I thought that one was like, just to kind of like, oh yeah, we love the young people. I, you can go to any church. Mm-hmm. I don't care what ethnicity the church is or, or whatever. Oh, we love the young people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until the young people start to have a position of authority too. <laughs> yeah. And then, then it's like, oh, y'all are too young to be talking to me. Hmm. You're too young to be leading me. Yeah. Or why are we letting young people have this much, you know, leadership or a microphone or this, that I'm thinking back. Do you read the Bible? Like Jeremiah was talking to the whole nation and he's like 17 years old. Yeah. He's God's mouthpiece. Yeah. You know, Mary, teenager, Josiah, under 10, you know, it's like David, teenager, the disciples, early 20s. I mean, like on and on and on. And so that's just a side note that there are things that I thought that people would be so excited about yeah. mm. and, and they become so villainized and that's even my family, even my family being a part of ministry. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, man, if you looked at a family and go, look, there's his son. Oh, there's his other son. There's his wife. There's his daughter-in-law. Man, I bet the younger ones, I can't wait to see what God does in them. And instead it's like, I'm going to see if I can't be the one that makes sure this kid gets it like he needs to get it. He's probably, his dad's probably living through him, you know, (laughs) vicariously. Got a Mm. silver spoon in his mouth or something. (laughs) And it's like, what other world would we not be okay with if you were a lawyer that your son just went on into the law practice? Mm. Or you were a basketball player. And guess what? Guess what Adrian's son's doing? He's playing basketball. He'll probably have some ministry too because that's what he sees his dad doing. And yet in ministry... That's the one place that we, nepotism. (laughs) I don't get, like, that's literally, I don't get why we attack the things that we pray for and we would hope for, for anybody else. That's it. I want you, that's it. Because I know, and again, I can say this, is that, you know, I mean, your son, Caleb, I mean, Caleb and I have a very close relationship um, and really helping be a part as just another anchor in Caleb's life as a mentor. Um, you know, Caleb, you know, he reads and he's well versed and well studied. And I know he has taken tons of hits because of his stance for justice. And you know what? The one thing I love about Caleb is that even when I go to him and I say, Hey chief, you need to back down a little bit. He listens. He's mm-hmm. like, Oh, I can see that. And he listens. But here's one thing I also too. I don't, and I always tell them, I don't want to clip Caleb's wings because you know what? We talk about, listen, why we talk about this generation doesn't do anything. Now we have somebody doing something. And yes, Mm -hmm. could there be greater for everybody? Could there be greater wisdom? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But the thing is not to clip his wings. It's to actually fly alongside and make sure they know how to fly instead of clipping their wings. Well, you need to sit here and you need to do this. And my question is this, what the heck are you doing? Because let me tell you, the same people who will criticize him is the same. Listen, there you have not led that many people to faith. You have not been that people who have given your life to actually using your skill set to do it. It's not like the kid is sitting up there. And I'm using Caleb, who like making a ton of money. He's given his life to ministry as a smart. He can do something else and make way more money. Right. He's giving his like that's what yeah. you hope for, and then you crap on something like that. Mm-hmm. And see, that's the problem. What I've come to realize: people just like they don't want to solve problems. They just want to talk about them. That's all our country has turned into is you just want to talk about issues. Because when you actually see somebody young, instead of seeing, man, look at who they are. You're like, wow, man, like, is there a crap? Let's help them. Yeah. yeah, he can lose. Let's give him some grace because don't forget how stupid we were. Right. Well, another like, thing I'm, about- like, I'm like, you know, I'm 21 years old. I'm like, oh, gosh. I wish I was half the man ki- like your son. Is. Yeah. Like, like, like I'm looking right? at Bree. She's 21 years old. I'm like, yeah, I wish I had half the ability and the wisdom. 21 years old. It's like, man, yeah. I, I was just like, <laughs> For man, I was on Dreamcast. <laughs> getting yeah. It. Like, yeah, yeah. I was, that was it. Yeah. Like, yeah. I couldn't even, I couldn't even clean my bathroom or my dorm room or whatever. <laughs> like, I, you're like, the, and it's true. Yeah. I, I really think there's an acceleration 
in this generation that yes. we've not yeah. seen yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yep. it's, Cause it's the yeah. antithesis of what they're accused of being like mm. snowflakes and, and they can't take this. And yeah, like y'all, you know, Keith on his podcast, there's always an overcorrection mm-hmm. and, and maybe there's an overcorrection right now in some of the things that we're doing, but God will even it out. He'll yeah. iron it out. But this generation Talk about is it. going to be, uh, they're going to be zealous about what they yeah. uh, have in their hearts and what they yeah. believe. And they're going to go for it. Mm. And guess what? Doing church, here's the doing church with young people and, and multiple ethnicities and cultures is going to be messy. Yeah. 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 And we like church to be neat and clean mm. and nice and, and happy and fun. And there's not a lot of happiness right now, but there is an abiding joy. There, there's not a lot of cleanliness. It's messy. Uh, but, but where there's mess, there's life. That's what I was always taught, right? Yeah. Whatever there's a mess, there's life. Mm. Go to a farm. There's a lot of mess, but there's life. Mm. That's it. You know, yeah. and, and so we're here we are in the church, and you've got young people, you've got old people, you've got middle-aged people, middle class, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different cultures, different nationalities, different nations, and they all come together, and it's impossible. I, literally, I have said this in the last couple of years because I never thought this until – it is impossible to build a church like we're supposed to build without Jesus. Mm. Impossible. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly contextually, and I know our context is different than others, yeah. but I'm talking about mm. in this divide that we deal with with black and white a lot of times. It And it's not just that. It's really just people of color and white. That is impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit moving and operating. So. Uh, back to how I led the staff and my family through this. It was hard. As a father, you want to protect your kids from pain for as long as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did. And Carl and I did. And we were very like, we don't want them to see these things. We want them to love people because there are times, you know, like, I don't want, I don't even like people right now. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to go to church. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I don't want them to feel that way. Not now. I mean, like, at like, least let them experience some, you know, enjoyment of the body for a while. Uh, and honestly, we, we, we didn't get to do that for very long and they got to see some things and personally attacks where it hurt them. Um, and, and that hurts mom and dad and, you know, friends as much or more than it hurts them probably. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I just had to say, listen, we're in a spiritual battle. You know, that was, it was like, Mm -hmm. that was one thing to remind myself and everybody else, staff, family included, Mm -hmm. we're in a spiritual battle. We are building something God's called us to build. We're not going to come down off this wall. We're going to do what God's called us to do. If we have nobody else, we're going to have us. I mean, there were times we'd say that, you know, Mm. y'all, we've all we got. There are times we're like, look, if we got nobody else, our family's going to be together and we're going to keep doing what Jesus called us to do. Mm. And the staff, it was just, some of it was just intentional. Hey, read this. I want you to read this. Like, you don't just not read stuff. Like, Uh here's this good book. Read this book by, you know, whatever uh, author, Jamar Tisby, or read this book by Esau McCauley, or read this book by, you know, uh, uh, Soon Chan Ra. You know, I I just always give them books. And what I finally got, and obviously, read Acts. Read the book of Amos. And we've done, we've done Amos Bible studies. Carla's teaching one right now. The, you know, the social justice prophet is who mm-hmm. Amos is. And we're teaching. What does the Bible say? What does Acts say? What is, and then what does this pastor say? And what does this, read this. And don't come to me with a conversation until you've done some study on your own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and I have. I've read more in the last two years than I probably read in the previous 49. Mm-hmm. Literally, I'm serious. Yeah. Like finishing books, not like start. I've started a ton in my yeah, life, yeah, yeah. but I'm finishing all the way to the end. <laughs> Even if I get on audible to the end, yeah. I'm getting to the end. Yeah. You're hearing that, man. The, you, you're getting all the way to the credits. At the end I'm, of audible, hey, right? I'm listening like, to it. Recommend this book. You know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but it's just met, letting them know they've got this. This is a higher calling than just us doing church. This is to win for the lamb, the reward of his suffering. Mm. And if okay. we're going to suffer yeah. to go through that in some shape or fashion, not nearly like Paul or Jesus, I'm not saying that, but there is suffering emotionally. There's been a lot of trauma emotionally for our staff and, and our family. Mm-hmm. Um, but it will not compare. And you just go back to the word. This will not compare. Paul said 
to what I'm going to experience in heaven forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's kind of where I want to kind of go a little bit in terms of maybe you guys have been through it and you're still walking through it by by no means like you're out of it, but Uh, never will be. What's the, what's the, what's some of the fruit? Like, like the the Bible talks about, man, what pressure does and Mm -hmm. how it refines. And so I'm interested in what is this causing you staff, family, you know, I think it started a couple of years ago, but I think emotionally, uh, from an emotional health standpoint, our church has become a whole lot better. Uh, we had someone, you know, Dr. Zoda came up and spent some time with our staff, and he's like, you guys are awful at conflict resolution. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah, because I'm codependent, my wife's codependent, we like, you know, cling on, or we don't do well with it, or I'm an avoider, like, let's just avoid it and I'll appeal and appeal and appeal and I'll keep reading the story like well I ended in death let me go back and try that again yeah. let me choose yep. another adventure <laughs> with the same people and it's like no that's insanity hey, like this book's never going to end any differently but I couldn't get out of that so much so that it, it sent me emotionally into depression clinically um, but so I learned that's one of the things I learned almost to my detriment almost to burnout that I had to handle my emotions and the pain that was going to come when you're paying the cost Mm-hmm. that I learned how to lament. And that's one of the things I took our church through. And, and I was able to preach here at you, you know, at engage a couple of weeks ago that listen, this is a part of the lexicon of worship that we don't get into. Um, and maybe particularly the white church hasn't understood because we've come from a triumphalism type standpoint, as opposed to a, you know, a, a difficulty or a suffering standpoint, but the historic black church understood how to do that. That's why you had the Negro spiritual, right? You yep, know, swing yep. low, sweet chariot coming forth to carry me home. Why? Because I want to get out of here. This can't be all that there is. Yeah. Man. You know, so about it's it. like, that's why the body of Christ helps each other in our diversity is we, if there was ever a time to learn from somebody not like me, it would be like, well, how do I learn from my black brother and sister how to be able to worship Jesus in the midst of suffering, Mm -hmm. in the midst of corporate suffering, not just personal suffering. Mm -hmm. And, and, and now I can, it's like, wow, the, because we're going through some suffering in our world corporately, not just, I'm talking about everybody, whether it's through our health and our economy and things like that. And I believe it'll get worse and we're going to have to know how to lament. So one of the things we've learned is that Mm -hmm. one third of the Psalms were laments and we can sing and pray to God that way, not so that we can just bemoan and complain, but so that we can take our honest emotions, that's emotional health, before Jesus and say, God, this stinks. God, I don't like this. God, this is painful. How long is this going to I mean, I've been to these. How long is this going to last? How long are people going to look at us and think that we're failing? How long is the, is the money going to not be where, like I want it? How long are we going to see this type of thing going on? How long is it going to look like somebody else is winning that shouldn't be winning? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I've said those things and I don't always get answers, but that, that, that lament takes us to a place of trust, which takes us to a place of intimacy with God, where we say, God, I don't know what you're doing. And I sure wouldn't have moved into a building and then had COVID and then had, uh, Mm. you know, Ahmaud Mm. Arbery and George Floyd. I I sure wouldn't have moved into a building and had an election year with Donald Trump. I I would have never have moved into a building like this, but you did Lord. And I trust you, but it makes zero sense and it hurts and it looks like we're failing, but I trust you. Yeah. And that's hard, but that is one of the things that we're learning deeper trust. And then lastly, what I think we're learning is that the metrics of grace and growth are not what we've always thought they were. And that means that it's not about the money. And it's not about the people. He said, oh, you can say that when you don't have the money and the people. You got to say that. No, 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 no. I say we have put too much emphasis on the money and the people. And it's been a balm or a salve on open wounds to make us think that we're being blessed by God because we got a lot of people and the bank accounts are flush and we're doing well, but spiritually we can't resolve conflict. Yeah. It's, right, it's, right, it's right. a mile long and an inch deep mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. we're not really spiritually healthy. Mm-hmm. It's emotionally not real prosperity. Healthy. It's, it's not real prosperity. There's not, there's, there's not any spiritual health. Yeah. So yeah. the depth of our spiritual health, though the numbers are smaller, I mean, the, the money's not like it was. Um, 
our spiritual health is stronger than it's ever been before. Our staff is stronger than it's ever been before. Our people are going to be strong and we're going to need to be in order to build what God's called us to build yeah. in the middle of Georgia. And so that's one of the things that, that we've learned and we're learning is to trust God when the storehouse doesn't feel like it's full at all. Um, and that it's day by day, uh, that we don't get, you know, give us this day, our daily bread. It's not, you know, I, I need a month's worth in the bank. <laughs> Apologies to Dave Ramsey, but that don't always work. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, hit the button on that one. You know, I, I, I ain't got five months of payroll in the bank. You know, sorry, Dave. Uh, but you know, G- <laughs> you get real yeah. on that one. Yeah, but, but Jesus said, "Hey, you're gonna have to trust me day by day." Uh, you just don't like to do that when you got a mortgage payment hanging over your head and Man, there's families around that you yep. love and you don't yep. want to see them go through anything. And that's, mm-hmm. that's really it. I, I'm trying not to be naive. I'm trying not to be ignorant. I'm really just trying to learn how to trust God in a situation that I didn't ask for uh, in the sense of where we are, but that I believe in mm-hmm. and that I, and yeah. I'm willing to go to. Yeah. And I want to, I mean, I think that, you know, it's kind of what I, even as we're recording this, what I preach today. You know, it's the it's the Jeremiah 17 where he talks about how, you know, the promise of God is you'll produce fruit in every season. But it says our roots have to go deeper into the water. One of the things I can say is knowing Brent for a long time and through this process is that his through all the suffering and things he's gone through, his roots have he made it a priority. Yeah. It's always been a priority for his roots to grow deeper into Jesus, his his uh, like his actual spiritual disciplines, the things he does to commune with God, which now, again, like I talked about today, fruit is produced. Mm-hmm. It's just a fruit. Sometimes, like I said, yeah, the money in the bank account, the people, that's the fruit that the world gives you an applause for. Mm-hmm. But the internal character fruit that you're saying, man, conflict, the stuff that's going to make you healthy and, and ha- allow you to grow into have stuff that remains, that fruit has been produced even in the season that externally the other stuff is seeming to be pruned away oh, and yeah. seeming to be hard. But fruit is still being produced because, again, a promise of God is it says that if your roots grow deep in him, you will produce fruit in every season that's great. the key is understanding what fruit are you looking for and that's what i've seen i've seen fruit produce i have seen the fact of where no where brent's like no no i am ending this this relationship because of how unhealthy it is which he never would have done i've seen him leaning i've seen listen some of you guys need to understand this i'm a father of three you know you know pastor Derek's a father of two you say something attack my children, you're getting every bit of the smoke of it. <laughs> now, now, yeah, it's coming. now, the reality is I've watched Brent like be so gracious yeah. with people. And that is a fruit of the spirit. That's something I'm learning from because I'm like, man, no, no, no. You attack my wife and my children. Like, like I said, in the words of Bradley Bills, these hands work. You know what I'm <laughs> like these hands work. Woo-hoo. But but I'm learning, but I watch Brent, I'm like, man, like where he can stand firm, but man, still give grace and not go there. And that is a fruit of the spirit. Well, I'll say this that. too, as it relates to the kids, is I may not come and act like, you know, a parent that's lost their mind on you. I, I hope I don't. But I will go behind the scenes and I will tell my kids who they really are yes, and yep. uh, how proud I am of them. Mm-hmm. Like, look, I may not get on Facebook and, and banter back and forth yeah, with yeah, this yeah. person about you. Um, I'm not saying I'm above that or it hasn't happened, but, you know, God forgive me that that's not the place to go. But I will go to whether it's Caleb or Josiah or Carla or Anna and Issy and Zano or Jasmine, you know, and I will look say, look, I'm proud of you. Mm-hmm. and I love you, and there is nobody that is for you other than God more than me, mm-hmm. and, and I want to see you succeed, and don't worry about that stuff, and, and I know I say that, or don't listen to that, mm-hmm. um, and I've been telling my kids, you know, every night before I go to bed, I would say, I'll say these things, you know, and y'all have heard me talk about it before, and I yeah. tell them things that I want them to be, like, this is who... 
I believe God says you are. So this is who your dad says that you are because you're going to hear everybody else tell you all kinds of things that you are that you're not. Mm -hmm. And so I'd have my routine with them every single night before they go to bed. And the boys, it was like, you know, you're my night warrior, king, leader, worshiper, tough guy, strong boy, pure guy, and you're going to win the world for Jesus. And then when I had Anna, it was like, okay, I got to change that up a little bit. So it's Mm -hmm. like, you're my princess, pretty girl, Cinderella, sweet girl, joy-filled girl, kind girl, pure girl, and you're going to win the world for Jesus. And I'd also tweak them sometimes if they were struggling with something and one of the kids was struggling in school and they, you know, maybe they weren't going to be the straight A 4.0. Mm-hmm. You know what I tell them? I'd say, you're, you're my smart girl or my smart boy mm-hmm. because the school's going to tell you you're not, but I want you to know that you are. It may not be the same metric, but you are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's the same thing. So if I don't defend them and I will sometimes, but if I don't defend them publicly and if somebody's like, man, if I'm listen to me, I don't have to defend them out there on social media. They know what I think about them. Yeah. And I'm going to go tell them yeah. again to their face where it really matters. Yeah, no. And that's, and that's really good. One of the last things I want to ask as we kind of come to a close is this, is that, you know, what you did not mention. And again, we know that, you know, you have two adopted children. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things about one of your adopted children, you have, you know, Zano, um, and again, shout out to Zano, young, young King, um, <laughs> you know, um, like as a, as a white father mm-hmm. to a young black man, mm-hmm. what are you teaching him and what are you communicating with him? Because that is, I mean, that is in his current moment, yeah. you know what I mean? Of him growing in there, you know, it's funny. I love Zano. Every time I go see Zano, I take Zano with me somewhere because one of the biggest things I always want him to know is the fact of. You know, he's getting all these things of love from from home, from, you know, from Pastor Brendan. But what I also want him to understand as another black man to understand who he actually is and to say that to him. And I take him and we go get food and we do stuff like that because I want him to understand, too, and just really echo the same things that Pastor Brent says because it matters, Mm -hmm. you know. And so, I mean, what are you actually, you know, what are some things, you know, for the people, you know, to do that? I appreciate that. It's like uh, it's like A.D. Thompson in Permission to be Black. You Mm -hmm. know, it's he needs to see there's a one percent out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yep, yep. He needs to see that uh, that it, it's not some impossibility or, or some unicorn, as we like to yep. say. Um, and and I do, and and that is part of our 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 every nation family, our, our global family, is that there's a global side of that uh, cultural ethnic diversity that he gets to see mm-hmm. um, when we go to the different churches. He gets to see that, and then a lot of the guys that I'm friends with that are coming into our church look like him too. And, and that's intentional. Like Carl and I said a long time ago, they are not growing up in all white spaces. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, the books, the, the artwork in our house, uh, the calendars in our house, we got an EJI calendar in our house. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got artwork of and dolls that look like them. Um, it's, it, it's not, we're not making them assimilate into, you know, our culture, so to speak. They are a, they are our family and we are multi-ethnic and multicultural in our family. Yeah. So the things yeah. in our house, the relationships out inside of our house, outside of our house, um, are going to reflect that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're also international. So coming from South Africa, that brings its own, I mean, shoot, let's talk about a messed up place too and going yeah, through yeah. their own issues yeah. very similar to ours. Um, and, and one day they'll want to go back mm-hmm. and, and they're going to see some, you know, where they came from is, Oh, I mean, I can't even explain the, the, the poverty and the brokenness, but there's, so that's that element. But then just here culturally in the South, um, we've been intentional with, you know, here's your friends and, and hair and going to the barber shop and, mm-hmm. and, or somebody, you know, of course everybody tells, Hey, tells Issy how she should do her hair. It's like, yeah. that's one thing like, like white people don't stop each other in the, in the store <laughs> and tell each other how to do our hair. Hey, true. Yes. Hey, but yeah. listen, I can't tell you how many people, well, you need to put a little bit of conditioner in this girl's hair. Hey, hey, boy, they, hey, hey do they, I know you? Hey, they give you all type of products. Got, too, you know like, we hey. got more hair products <laughs> underneath our sink than Walmart. I mean, it like, I, I'm like, what do we do with all this? I literally went outside with a whole basket full of stuff recently and, and asked my wife, do we actually use any of this? <laughs> And yes, we use this for this, and Issy uses this for this, and and I'm like, I just like the clippers on Zano, and I just go out there, bzz, all off, man. And so, 
Uh, but we're, we're intentional and we're going to be more intentional. And it, it is important about the relationships. And fortunately, like friendships and our staff, mm-hmm. you know, like our, our youth pastor, Pastor Keevan or or Cam, who's one of our production leads or Thomas, who's one of our uh, facility managers or Jasmine, who's a now sister in law and one of our worship leaders um, on and on and on so that they see people like them. Uh, and that should be normal, honestly. Yeah. That the spaces that we're in, listen, if we're going to build churches that are multi ethnic and multicultural in the space, then we got to have lives that are the same way. Yeah. 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 And that's the thing. That's where the big cost and the big problem is, is most, it's like we're cool with it here. But then outside, we go back to our spaces and our places and never the twain shall meet. And it's like, yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. This bleeds over into every area of our life, and it does for us and our family. So Issy and Zano are going to grow up, uh, you know, in my mind, in, in, in the most beautiful of communities wow. uh, that probably any of our kids have grown up. They get to experience it more than even Caleb and, and Josiah and Anna Joy maybe have uh, because our church has changed, and God's doing something in the church, I believe, in North America. Yeah. He's changing some things, and we might be smaller. We may be Gideonized but we're going to still win the battle because we're going to be stronger. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, Pastor Brent, man, I want to tell you, thank you so much again uh, for coming, being on the podcast, always investing, you know, um, you know, into, you know, engage you and, you know, uh, Carla, Carla has been great here. I tell people, you know, man, the, the first, uh, the honestly, the first woman who preached at and you know and gay was mm-hmm. was was Carla and man and so gifted um, to be able to do that and um, you know you guys have always just been an incredible investment. I mean, incredible friends. We could tackle that. that uh, oh man, we could tackle that next time. If yeah, we can. We can talk about yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> women, <laughs> that, uh, women that women that women in ministry, you know, women hey, in ministry. Let's just go like ahead and hit all the sacred cows, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and throw that, throw those grenades <laughs> out there. Um, but no, I really appreciate that. And honestly, you know, what Wendy and I actually have, uh, you know, said, and I want to say this, you know, again, you, you want to, you know, the words of Kanye West, you know what I'm saying? You want to give them their smile, give people their flowers while they still can smell them is that, you know, one thing I really appreciate about you is you have like, and, and again, we won't say it publicly. I mean, we won't say like what the situation is or situations have been. But one thing I know about you is that if push comes to shove and we got to go into a fight, like I know you're gonna fight. Like you know what I'm saying. Where it's like, yeah, yeah. Like you know what I'm saying. It's kind of like it's like the movie The Towns. Like whose car are we driving? Right. You know what I'm saying. Like that's how. And I really appreciate that because in me, the core of who I am is that that when I'm your friend and I believe in you, it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like we're going to war. Like we'll go to war together. Even if times I don't agree with you, we'll talk about that behind closed doors. Right, but in front exactly. of everybody else, if we know they're the enemy, oh, we're going to war. And I really, really appreciate that about, you know, about you and Carla and mm-hmm. what you guys have spoken um, to our lives, what your boys have been inside of Jalen, Joseph, Joseph, Jalen. Um, yeah. Again, their, their shared music taste, which is just wild. <laughs> um, and that, yeah. and if you want to follow somebody on <laughs> iTunes and can't figure out where they're from or what their background is, <laughs> follow, follow Joseph, Josiah. Josiah Gerard. <laughs> I know whenever something comes out, Joseph sent it to me and Jalen. I'm coming i'm like man who is this i'm like man if y'all send me another quando rondo who's shysty who's shysty like, you know what, I'm what? spot him got I him thought he I'm was like, joking me spot him got, got him. him yeah listen don't go listen to that all right but anyway i have, but I have I really, no idea man <laughs> but, but i appreciate you guys and what you've uh what you've been and um and again i appreciate you again i say this too as a black man i appreciate you guys standing where you don't have to it's it, you don't have to do it but you're doing it and it's going to lead to a lot amen um, and i really really appreciate that so guys i want to encourage you that listening to this pod listen you hear this you hear this story so here's what you have to do not bring this down to your level and saying man maybe you're going through something and again to realize this that as you grow deeper roots the fruit that's being produced maybe right now you're actually realizing man this walk you didn't realize maybe you're 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 new in your journey of faith and you're like, oh, I didn't realize this walk is going to cost me this much. Mm-hmm. But to realize that it's definitely worth it. It is definitely worth it. And that at the end of the day, it's you are going to see fruit that remains. It is. I'm telling you, in serving Jesus, it is painful. But I can tell you, I've had in my lifetime, I've not had greater joys than I've had 
being in the kingdom of God like than I have. And so I want to encourage you guys, if you're going through and it's cost them, keep walking, keep moving, keep going through the valley. Jesus is walking right there with you. And so again, as we go through this process of launching innovative rack and silos, as we go to the world, we're going to do it. And God is up to something amazing, you know, in his church. And I believe that we get to play a part to it. So, man, we appreciate all you guys. Until next time, we'll see you soon on Street Theology.